Well, good morning. Wonderful to see everybody here this morning. Let's begin our time together with prayer. Father, we thank you that you uh, have called us into covenant relationship. We thank you that you didn't have to do that, but you chose to call us into covenant because you love us. Uh, we ask you to open minds and hearts today as we approach your word, as we listen to you uh, call us into that covenant relationship, uh, individually and particularly as the church. Um, please uh, bless our time together. It's through your son that we pray. Amen. So, as mentioned, come a little hot here, uh, uh, Ben, if you take that down. It, it sounds, it sounds, uh, all I can hear up here is me. <laughs> so let me know if it's too low, if you can't hear me. Normally that's not a big problem. You can hear too much of me, and that's, that's usually how this works. Uh, today we're going to talk about the church uh, community as a covenant community. Uh, I want to do uh, just a, a brief review. We've talked about covenant multiple times uh, in past classes, but uh, there are two kinds of covenants in uh, not just Bible terms, but uh, sociological terms. Uh, there's covenant between equals. Uh, you are a powerful person, and uh, person B over here is also a powerful person. You don't want to go to war with each other, so you come together and you say, can we work something out here? That's a covenant between equals. Then there is the covenant that we see over and over again in the Bible. That's called a suzerain covenant, uh, S-U-Z-E-R-I, uh, no, E-A-N, uh, if you're, if you're going to go look it up on Google. Uh, and what it means is a covenant between someone who is more powerful and someone who's less powerful. And the characteristic of suzerain gov covenants is the more powerful, more powerful person dictates the terms of the covenant to the less powerful person. So Babylon comes through and uh, thoroughly defeats uh, Judah, uh, the southern kingdom that remains after Assyria has come through and thoroughly defeated the northern kingdom of Israel. Uh, and the king of Babylon then says, okay, here's what's going to happen from here on out. You're going to send me your best and brightest. Uh, when I need an army, you're going to send people uh, and money. Uh, and when my army marches through here, you're going to feed them. Uh, and he, he rattles off all these things that Judah is going to do for him. And, of course, the alternative, if they choose to break that covenant, is he does exactly what he did when they broke his covenant. He sent an army back up. He defeated them again. He dispersed virtually everybody out. He had left a puppet king in place. The puppet king led the rebellion, and uh, so he immediately wiped out the puppet king uh, and uh, pretty well cleared the place. Uh, so that's a suzerain covenant. That's the covenant we see over and over and over again uh, in the Bible. Starting in the Old Testament, God makes a covenant with Noah. This is, this is kind of an exceptional thing because Noah has already demonstrated uh, his obedience uh, to and his faith in uh, God uh, prior to the establishment of God's covenant uh, with Noah, which has to do with not destroying the earth by water again. Uh, Abraham is the covenant we immediately go to when we think of this. Uh, Through your seed, all nations of the earth will be blessed. And he's saying this to Abram, who has exactly how many children at this point? None. Yeah, right. So there's, this is a significant leap of faith on Abram's part and later Abraham. Uh, and, and, but that's, that's the nature of these biblical covenants. God, who is all-powerful, dictates the terms to humans who are, uh, at, at best, of limited uh, power. And uh, the terms that God dictates to his people are always completely out of character with the terms that a king, a, a conquering king, dictates to his people. You notice when we were talking about the Babylonian king, what did he want? You will do this, you will do that, you will do something else, and if I want more, you'll do that too, okay? God comes to humans with this extraordinary uh, covenant. I will bless you. Uh, not only that, but through you, I will bless all nations of the earth. Uh, that's not what the conquering king normally does, right? The conquering king gets more stuff for himself Here's God giving away all these wonderful blessings, and in return he asks for what from Abraham? One thing. Faith. Yeah, yeah. 
He's looking simply for a faith that leads to obedience. Abraham, I want you to sacrifice the son that I just gave you in your old age in such a way that you cannot possibly think you're ever going to have another one. <laughs> I want you to take him up and I want you to sacrifice him. And Abraham says, you gave me the first son, you can figure out how to fulfill your promise, I'm going to do what you told me to do. That's the only thing that is required of Abraham, is to have enough faith in God to act on what God tells him to do. Uh, could we all do just fine in our Christian lives if we just obeyed that covenant? Would, would we be doing the things that we should be doing if we were in obedience to the old covenant? Yeah, really, it doesn't require a whole lot of uh, reading of Leviticus or, uh, or all of the sacrificial stuff and all that sort of thing. The, the old covenant, at its essence, is the new covenant. <laughs> okay? That's one of the things that I'd like for us to, to come away uh, from uh, today is with this idea in mind that the two covenants, and, and by the way, the, the word testament, when we talk about Old Testament, New Testament, that's a transliteration of the Latin word testamentum, which is the translation of a Greek word that then follows on the Hebrew word, all of which does not mean the last will and testament of William W. Roberts uh, dispersing the vast wealth of the Roberts estate uh, to his various heirs and assigns. It means covenant. It's, it is, at its essence, a covenant. A will and testament is a very specialized form of the much larger concept that's addressed in testamentum and, uh, and the Greek and Hebrew, which are both escaping my mind right now. Much escapes my mind. You've already realized that by now. Uh, so, so when we think of the Old Testament and the New Testament, we really should be thinking of a covenant that God has made with his people, starting basically with Adam, right? He's got the same kind of covenant relationship with Adam. I will provide for you. You will believe in me. I'm walking with you, what's not to believe? And you will follow what I say. If I tell you not to eat of that tree, you're not going to eat of that tree. And how well does that go? Not all that well, no. <laughs> right. But at the end of the day, God has been trying to make covenants with his people from day one and is still working on it today. And... So what I'd really like for us to do is to be able to look at God's word and say not Old Testament, long gone, don't worry about it, certainly don't spend any time studying it. We're not, we're just, we're not under that law anymore. Now we've got the bigger, better, newer covenant, and, uh, and, and that's the one that we will live with. It's the same covenant all the way through, but it is fulfilled. Uh, and of course... In, in English, and apparent, especially in American English, the, the terms old and new tend to be kind of pejorative, right? Do you want to buy the oldest of anything unless you're into antiques? You really would prefer to have the latest, greatest, newest, you know, especially if you're buying a car, boy. <laughs> Finding out what it takes to keep an old car, an, an old being 1994, not all that old, but uh, it takes a new computer every couple of years, evidently, to keep that going. Um, we, have a, we have a tendency to like new things, and so when we have a new covenant and an old covenant, we tend to say, eh, we're just going to kind of leave that off to the side here, because we've got this shiny new object that, uh, that we can spend our time with. And that's not to say we shouldn't be focusing on the New Testament, absolutely we should, but it's all of one piece of cloth, all the same word from the same God from day one to now. And so that's a, that's a separate sermon, and we don't really have time for a quick comment, and then we're going to go. I was going to say in all of this, God, unlike kings, knows mm -hmm. what we need, and yeah. he's already provided everything for us anyway. Exactly. The blessings are just an addition to what's mm -hmm. there. Yeah. And those blessings are to teach us to have faith yeah. in him. God provides. He is a providential God. We talk about providence as, as being a part of our lives, and, and yet we tend not to think about that fact. We're going to talk about that a little later. God has a covenant with Moses that turns into what we think of as the Mosaic Covenant, the Old Testament. Um, and ultimately, 
he makes a covenant with God's people. Um, and that turns out just about as well as all the other covenants he's made with people thus far, right? Because we keep not doing what we're supposed to do. We keep being weak in our faith, or worse yet, we believe, but we get selfish. And so even though we believe, we also believe in forgiveness, and we say, so he'll forgive me if I do this thing that I know he doesn't want me to do. So uh, one of the characteristics that we really want to focus on in the original covenant, I'm going to try and use original and fulfilled to refer to the, the 39 books and the 27 books. Uh, the original covenant requires sacrifice, uh, and that sacrifice is ongoing, uh, and it, it uh, is ultimately fulfilled in the fulfilled covenant by the ultimate sacrifice. So Matthew records Jesus uh, as he institutes what we will celebrate here in, in a few minutes. Uh, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. Parallel passage in Mark 14. My blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Luke goes a little bit beyond that. This the cup is poured out to you, poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. And the idea here is that Jesus is providing the fulfillment of this original covenant that God has with his people, you won't have to keep doing those sacrifices because as ineffectual as they are, because as stubborn and self-willed as you are, this sacrifice, this one-time sacrifice, is going to fix everything forward in time and backward in time. Uh, this is the one sacrifice that is that's going to take care of everything. And so Christ is retasking this covenant. Uh, he is fulfilling this covenant, but he's at the same time changing the whole model of how worship is going to happen. Um, the Jews, uh, the, the entire experience that your average Jew, not your priest or your Levite, but your average Jew, the entire experience that they had of interacting with God was a sacrificial mode. I need to sacrifice, and I need to go talk to the, to the priest to make sure that I'm getting this right, but I need to sacrifice for this purpose, purpose for this purpose, for this purpose. I need to tithe. I need to do all of those things uh, because I am essentially selfish and therefore sinful. Uh, Jesus comes along and says, I'm just going to finish that whole concern for you. You're not going to have to go to the priest and figure out what the Levitical laws require of you, all you're going to have to do is be faithful. Just stay the course. Believe in the person you've believed in. Paul talks about, I know whom I have believed and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep me, you know, that all of that stuff. That's, that's that core statement of faith that keeps us in covenant with our Creator and our Savior. Uh, in Luke's account, uh, Jesus just extends this covenant uh, with the communal observance. Do this in remembrance of me, the words that we have on our communion table uh, down here. Uh, it, it, he, he's now, instead of a sacrificial s uh, system that looks backwards, this past year I did this, 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 and this that I wasn't supposed to do, and I'm probably going to run out of fingers before I run out of things I wasn't supposed to do, that past year is now taken care of with this current sacrifice. Now we can start over again. Next year I'm going to do the same thing. Now he's saying, every time you participate in this, you are renewing this covenant with me. I've taken care of the sacrifice. You don't have to worry about what you did in the past. You should be trying to fix what you, do in the, what you did in the past. And, and get better at that. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But there's, there's no longer this, I have to do this because I did this. It's now Jesus took care of that, and all I have to do is just remember, just, just focus my mind and my body and my being around this experience that we'll have in just a moment. So do this in remembrance of me. Paul restates this in uh, 1 Corinthians 11, uh, which we get read at the table uh, frequently, and that's appropriate because it reminds us that, uh, that as often as we do this, 
we are celebrating the fact that the original covenant has been fulfilled and perfected in our lives. We now live that better because it's fulfilled covenant with God. All right, uh, comments before we move on? Anybody? Good, let's move on. The Gentiles are excluded from the original covenant. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't Gentiles in the covenant. <clears throat> uh, let's see, we did a class on Ruth, I think, a while back. Uh, she is a Jewish or non-Jewish? Decidedly non-Jewish. She's Moabite. She's kind of related. There's, a, there's some Moabite stra uh, strain of, of DNA uh, that, that has been related from time to time. But still, no one would confuse Moabites with Jews. And yet here she is, not just in the bloodstream, but in the messianic bloodstream. So there are exceptions to this rule, but the rule itself is uh, if you're not Jewish, you are not in covenant until Jesus comes, at which point suddenly anyone who believes can be in that covenant relationship. So Paul in Ephesians says, remember, this is two people who are currently Christians, uh, remember that you were at that time, before you were being baptized and, and added to the body of Christ, at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from the, the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. What a wonderful place to live, right? <laughs> the creator of the universe is pretty much unaware of your existence. Okay? Outside of the covenant... That's where we live. Okay? Now, how about Jews who were living outside of the covenant? Hmm, that presents an interesting problem, doesn't it? Uh, by being Jewish, they were the people of the covenant, but they could exclude themselves from that covenant, could they not? And did on a regular basis. In fact, part of the resolution of the covenant was for uh, God to talk to his people whom he loves and say, I'm going to send you off into captivity for a while. Let you think about it for 70 years and see if you get it any better once you've gotten back. Comment up here uh, that, we'll, that we'll get to right now. Being excluded from the covenant is something that we should feel as much as we think through it. The idea of, of being completely outside of that covenant. I suspect that people we're talking to that we'd like to influence to be Christ followers might respond at least as well to that emotion, that sense of being excluded, of being an outsider. They might respond to that emotion at least as much as they respond to the logical process. You're a sinner. You need to get that forgiven. We've got the means here. We'll get you dunked and now you're, you're all well, right? There's some feeling involved in this. Terry, go ahead. Well, I just wanted to... I might be nitpicking, but you said something a while ago about in contrasting the Jews and the Gentiles, mm -hmm. and you said the Gentiles, like God was pretty much unaware of your existence. I, yeah, you're right. I'm overstating because, that by a long well, ways. Yeah. Yeah. And, that, and I know that, but just for maybe other people's Excellent. benefit. This, this does um, go out on YouTube. I should be careful about what I say. Right. <laughs> um, God had a plan to take care of the Gentiles, and, and there's all kinds of prophecies yep. that talk about when he first made the promise to Abraham, he said, all nations are yep. going to be blessed through your seed. Yep, absolutely. So, while it is true that they were excluded from yep. the Old Covenant up until the time of Jesus, it wasn't because God didn't Wasn't care about aware of them. them. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's that was a very poor thank choice you. of words on my part, and thank you for uh, for bringing that around. Uh, God has always loved everyone, Jew and Gentile, and uh, clearly by the the process of being excluded from the covenant, he was not in any way. And Ruth is the classic example of that. Uh, he was not in any way excluding. No, you can't get in because you're not the right kind of person. You you weren't born into the right family. Uh, he was always open to bringing people in. In fact, the law, the, the Mosaic law, includes all kinds of things about the sojourner, the, the person who's attached himself or herself to your household, uh, but, uh, but is not Jewish, uh, and 
all of the all of the laws that applied to Jews uh, applied in for the most part to the to the people who just kind of came into the the Jewish orbit, uh, and so it was it was fairly easy uh, for there to be a process of of acclimation to uh, to being Jewish even though you weren't born Jewish. Uh, lots of references to um, in in the New Testament record in Acts to people who were not Jewish ethnically, but who had become Jewish because they were converts to Judaism. And uh, there was even a lot of debate in Acts as to whether uh, people who were becoming Christians had to also become Jews. Uh, so clearly God had this plan from the very beginning and was happy to welcome everyone in. Paul, however, is making the point that unless we are welcomed in by God, uh, we're not, we don't belong here. Uh, so that's Ephesians 2, no hope and without God in the world. Uh, the Ephesian Christians, being predominantly Gentile, uh, were separated from God uh, and, and became one with the Jewish converts uh, because of this inclusion in that covenant. This becomes important when we talk about the body of Christ uh, in uh, 14 through 16, uh, the, those verses of the second chapter. He himself, that is Jesus, is our peace, who has made both groups, Jewish and Gentile, into one, has broken down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, the, the status of being enemies, which is the law of commandments contained in the ordinances, that's the Mosaic law, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross. So that's really a critical concept here as we think about what it means to be Jewish versus what it means to be Gentile. In Paul's terms here in Ephesians, to be Jewish is to be included in the, in the plan from the beginning. To be Gentile is to be included in the plan because of the activity of Jesus. But ultimately, look at that last sentence, might reconcile them both, Jew and Gentile. Both of them need to be reconciled to God. They both become one body under God, and they become that one body through the cross. Okay? So being Jewish is good. Uh, being Gentile is okay now, but both require reconciliation. Both require the cross. And uh, that's really uh, an important concept that, that Paul wants us to get. Gentiles by birth have double celebration in the communion, the perfection of the covenant through Christ, and the addition of ourselves to that covenant body that originally excluded us because uh, we weren't Jewish. <clears throat> and then uh, in chapter 8, uh, Paul goes on, I'm sorry, this is Hebrews, uh, Hebrews 8, quotes verbatim the prophet Jeremiah, uh, predicting that the Mosaic covenant was going to be replaced uh, by a new covenant, and here's that text uh, in its entirety. Behold, days are coming, uh, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant uh, which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand, to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, uh, although I was husband to them, declares the, the Lord, uh, but this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They shall not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, they will all know me from the least to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. I will forgive their iniquity, their sin I will remember no more. So that really is the summation of what we've been talking about in this covenant. The distinction between the original covenant and the fulfilled covenant is that instead of having this annual thing that we have to do because we keep messing up, we now are in uh, an environment where we're going to continue to mess up, but we're going to continually be cleansed uh, from that. And uh, it's no longer uh, a, a requirement that we either be uh, a part of the body of the Jewish nation or somehow or another attach ourselves to that. 
we will be included if we are human. Uh, and, and that inclusion is, is sufficient for all of us. Uh, Hebrews 9 and 10 elaborate on the comparison uh, between the Mosaic and the Messianic co covenants. Also the Mosaic and the Messianic methodologies. So the, all, of the, all of the symbolism of the Old Testament, uh, I slipped into that again, didn't I? Of the, of the original covenant symbolism is gone in the New Testament. Did it again. Because the, uh, the, the, the symbolism, the symbols of power and of authority and of operating uh, by the instructions of God, the jewels and the white linen and the ephod and the, the, the golden sash and all of that symbolism that went into the high priest have now gone to the new high priest, who is Jesus Christ. Yeah. So we don't need somebody all dressed up in the, in the special garments because he is in heaven <laughs> interceding for us, by the way. Uh, and, and so to him accrues all of the glory that was undeserved by any of the high priests is amply deserved, completely deserved uh, by our new and eternal high priest. And the Hebrews 9 and 10 talk a lot about that. Uh, the, the new covenant binds all believers together in one body. Here's uh, chapter 13. Now the God of peace, who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I'm concerned that sometimes, I know this is true in, in my life, and I assume I'm not that far out of, the, out of the mainstream, I tend to think of myself as being faced with the opportunity to do something good or to not do something good, and I have, it's like I have to decide. Do I have time to do this good thing, or, or am I going to do what I really would like to do? And the, the Hebrew writer here, doesn't seem to think that that's a decision uh, for me to make. Uh, may the God of peace, jump over all the descriptive stuff, equip you in every good thing to do his will. Who's equipping me to do those good things? Is that me because I make good decisions? God seems to be shaping me, giving me the tools that are necessary, uh, doing the things just kind of naturally. Okay, well, so where do I come in? Maybe uh, in choosing which ones? No, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight. you got a plan for me. <laughs> Not just that I'll be saved and that I'll go to heaven, but that I'll be there to do these things that he sets in front of me to do. Now, what happens if I get to one of those things and I really don't like doing that, and I'd really rather not? do that? Is it, is, it my, is it my right to not do that? Did it, there really shouldn't be any decision making for me. <laughs> I, I've, I fear that I don't live up to that. I, I hope I'm not alone in that, although it would, it would be nice if all the rest of you were perfect. Um, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through whom? Through my own personal strength and, and will to, to do the right thing? Through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Uh, if I actually do follow through and do those good things, should I receive any glory for it? It really belongs somewhere else, doesn't it? It belongs to the one who empowers me to do those things in the first place. That kind of puts a whole different spin on this whole Christian life, doesn't it? When you're out there talking to somebody who's not a Christian, and they look at you and they say, well, you're just a goody two-shoes, you just like doing good things for people. You're kind of one of those giving people. And you say, to God be the glory, number one. Number two, who empowers me to do those good things you see me doing? Is it because I'm a good person? Or is it because I'm empowered to do those things? Ben first, then down to Terry. Go ahead. I was going to say, you haven't quite got to it, but our Christian life is going to be a challenge because of Satan, mm -hmm. and he wants to tear us down. That's where that choice seems to come in. Is 
am I going to be faithful to God and choose God? Mm -hmm. Or am I going to let Satan into my life and take me away from giving God the glory which he deserves mm -hmm. because of what he's done? Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of, I think that's what you're talking about, the way we're supposed to do things and the way it's made to look by a lot of different groups that are out there that call themselves Christian but really don't actually give God that glory that yeah. he deserves. And I, and I would include us in, in that group too. You, you, you notice what Ben just did, he just took away the rest of the free will <laughs> piece here. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to decide whether I'm going to do this good thing or whether I'm not going to do this good thing. And uh, it isn't just that God is empowering me to do the good thing, but my tempter is tempting me not to do the good thing. And, and in all of this, the only piece that I have left is the decision as to who I'm going to listen to, who I'm going to follow, what I'm going to do, whose will I'm going to do. Uh, we're back to last week, uh, slaves and servants. Uh, you got to serve somebody. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you got to serve somebody. Terry, go ahead. Well, this, this is another scripture that just reinforces what you're talking about. Ephesians 2.10, I don't think we hit on it yet. Just, I think we missed it when we, we just you left were that 2, one out. You were 2.12, I think. Yeah. For we are his workmanship yeah. created in Christ Jesus for good works, yeah. which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Yeah. So God has already got the works that we're supposed, the good works that we're supposed yeah. to do all lined out for us exactly <clears throat> the opportunities come and and he put them there yeah amen so folks do we believe in predestination he's already he's already got the plan in place for us we are predestined to do good works i'm okay with that <laughs> not that you needed my permission but uh the idea of God being in control of our lives if we will simply cede that control to him as opposed to ceding control to the forces of evil uh, is, is an important part of our decision-making process. I don't have to get better, I just have to choose to listen to the right person. Now, we're going to get into American culture here. Uh, I, I want to take our last couple minutes to talk about the difference between being a consumer, which we all are, uh, and, and being a covenant person, which we all are, but the tensions between the two can play out in, I think, some ways that we might not think of. I, most of us, if not all of us, I think are old enough to remember when our daily newspaper, or if like me, your first memories of newspapers uh, we're in, in Hood River, Oregon, where there was a weekly newspaper. The venerable Hood River News uh, came out, I believe, on Friday. Uh, it had all the grocery ads in it, but it also had a part of a page uh, that said at the headline, Attend the Church of Your Choice. And then it had a listing of all the churches in Hood River and the, and the surrounding area. And uh, the, the message was clear you will be a better person, Hood River will be a better community if you attend the church of your choice. Which one you attend, here they all are, you make the decision, but attend the church of your choice. And that really, to me, is the essence of how American consumerism can insinuate itself into the lives of the covenant people. Um, and so we're going to follow that out a little bit. Uh, <clears throat> do you see the idea of attending the church of your choice anywhere in either covenant? Uh, I've, I've looked through it and, and come to the conclusion it's, it's really not there. You bloom where you're planted is pretty much the, uh, the, the biblical idea. Number one, there's no evidence uh, in the word. They may have existed, but we don't know about them, uh, of there being multiple congregations, uh, multiple assemblies of the saints uh, even in the largest cities and towns, it probably were predominantly, uh, particularly in the first century, they would predominantly have been house churches. Uh, we know that those churches, those assemblies, got together from time to time because we have all kinds of, uh, of uh, uh, writing uh, between leaders uh, talking about uh, the last time that, uh, that we were together and that sort of thing. But we really don't have a model 
for uh, the, the east side church in Rome versus the west side church in Rome. Uh, and, uh, and, and we certainly don't have a model of anyone saying, you know, I, I want to go to east side, I don't want to go to west side. Uh, the, 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 you know, Rome is, uh, Rome is well served by these two, but I prefer uh, this one over that one. It's, it's just not there. Uh, it's, it's nowhere in, the, in the, the word that I can find. Uh, I may be mistaken. There's no model for placing membership. We don't really have, uh, let's, let's get the comment back here with, with uh, Logan. Um, we, we don't have, that I'm aware of, any, any model for that. The model is what we're going to see in a minute. Uh, we're added to the church daily as we're being saved. Logan, go ahead. There, there is an example of that in, I believe it's 1 Corinthians, where Paul writes, about people saying, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas. Mm -hmm. And these people were like being disciples of the apostles rather than Jesus. Excellent. And Paul writes and says, no, no, no. Excellent. You are all disciples of Jesus yeah. only. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, our tendency, evidently, according to that passage, has always been to divide and be conquered, right? We, we love forming teams, <laughs> and we love having arguments. And I don't know if there's anything wrong with the arguments, but if it divides us, Paul seems to say, eh, I don't even care those of you who say you are of Paul. Uh, when, it's, when it's all said and done, if you're of Paul, you're in trouble. You have to be of Jesus. That's who unites us, and that's why we have this model over and over again of just being the body, lowercase t, lowercase b. It's just, the church just is. It just happens. Uh, and we have a tendency to think of ourselves as being kind of insular. Nobody in this building who's been in this building more than a couple of times uh, has any problem identifying where this is. This is the Eastside Church of Christ in Portland, Oregon, uh, in the early 21st century, and, and we, we are an entity, and that's, that's good. Uh, but to be able to choose a place uh, here as opposed to, to this one or that one or someone else, it's really kind of just not there in, in the Word. Certainly the opportunity to divide is there, but the encouragement of the Word is always to be united. Ben, go ahead, and then we're going to wrap up. I was going to say a lot of this is a cultural change in the Western European mm -hmm. groups versus... Mm -hmm what that was actually there as far as culture. The culture was actually centered around the people who lived there, mm -hmm. whether it was Rome or Ephesus or Galatia or whatever. Mm -hmm. It was always a community that had started and had ties, mm -hmm. kind of like our old um, cities in the farming community. That, mm -hmm. That's the kind of thing that you're looking at when you're looking at the New Testament. The Western European divides us. Yeah, yeah, and, and uh, that's, that's really the message of, of what we're talking about here. Culture impinges on the nature of the body and causes us to create structures that maybe are, are not uh, biblically uh, uh, proved. Uh, they may be okay, those structures. I, I don't have any problem with our having local congregations, um, but for us to rely on that structure as being biblical is probably stretching things just a little bit. Larry, go ahead. So on this uh, <laughs> placing membership, we uh, come together here and we say, I'm going to place my membership uh -huh. with Eastside. Uh -huh. When in theory we should be saying, I'm going to place my membership with God. <laughs> and I will work with Eastside. Yes. That's not a problem. Yeah. I'll work where I'm at. But we need to refocus on the fact that God is the one, not the fact that we're here at Eastside. Yeah. Amen. Eastside isn't much without our God and our Savior, uh, and that's, that's going to be uh, really the central focus, going to need to be the central focus. We're about to run out of time quickly. Well, quick, quickly, to my understanding, the, the, the difference between this attending the church of your choice today and, uh -huh. and during New Testament mm -hmm. times because on the, the basis that uh, today we have the multitude numbers of denominations that mm -hmm. after the, that begin to originate 
two and three hundred years after the New Testament was written, mm -hmm. and so it's a, to me it seems like a much different thing. Well, uh, certainly we have always had that tendency to divide and, uh, and to differentiate ourselves from people who kind of looked like us, but they didn't do this and we do that. And, and yeah, so that we've always had that tendency. And to a certain extent, that's, that's admirable, right? The, 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 the fulfilled covenant uh, is constantly talking about being aware of false teachers, right? And the false teachers tend to insinuate themselves and, uh, and, and that's a problem. Uh, the, 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 the point I want to make, and I'm going to try and rush through this right quick, conversion is personal, it's, uh, it's individual. Faith is located in the individual. We don't convert entire families. Sometimes that happens, but it's because individuals within those families have each made their, their faith decision. But our relationship with Jesus Christ is neither private nor individualized. When we develop a relationship with Jesus Christ, we are instantaneously added to the body. <laughs> when Jesus calls uh, uh, the, uh, I'm going to go through all of this. Uh, Jesus talks to a wealthy young man, and he loves this wealthy young man. Well, you've heard the commandments. Well, I've, I've done those all from youth, and yet I just, I just sense there's something more that I need to be doing. Jesus loves him, and what does he say to him? Empty yourself, get rid of the things that you love, and come follow me. And do you notice, does Jesus say, come follow me, we'll go out in the desert by ourselves, and, and you and I will just focus on... No, he says, come follow me with all these other unwashed people, and you all together are going to learn how to do what I do by watching how I deal with you and by dealing with each other in the same way. And I think there's something powerful there that we sometimes miss because we are so individualized, because our culture focuses on the individual so much. And we have individual rights, and I'm glad we do. Uh, but for us to bring that, that culture of individualization, and uh, I can jump up and leave any old time I feel like, that may be a problem. Uh, I, I was going to, to in, invoke a... a little story, but we'll save that for later on, maybe. Uh, that's, that's really where we'd like to, to wrap up. We are automatically members of each other. That's just how it goes. you got really not a lot of choice. Uh, and, and so that's, that's where we're going to land. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you that you have thrown us together into a human fruit salad that you then mix up according to your own plan. And that out of this, out of our interactions with each other, we become more like your son, and ultimately, we become the bride of your son, the husband of the church, Jesus the Christ. Would you bless us with uh, the, the understanding of what you have called us to do, with the awareness that you have given us the tools and the gifts to do those things, and the complete focus on one another, as we learn to be your children. Through your son that we pray, amen.